Hello, I'm David Blumberg, and welcome to Conversations with Entrepreneurs. Today I'm joined with my friend, Benny Nachman, who is a serial entrepreneur. He's the chairman of Credo Racks, and he's the founder and CEO of Jasby. He's a very busy gentleman. Uh, Hello, good afternoon, David. Thank you for inviting me. It's great to be here. Benny, we've known each other a long time. We've invested in your first company, which is Credo Racks. Uh, and then you've also founded Jasby. Why don't you first begin to tell us about Jasby, its product offering and its position in the market. Uh, and then next we'll go to Credovax. Sure. So Jasby is, uh, is a mobile money app for families and for parents of kids and teens. What we do is we connect three generations. We connect kids, we connect parents, and we connect grandparents. And the idea is that the adults would give money to the kids for any reason or for no reason. So it can be weekly or monthly allowances. It can be chores or doing great in school or in sports. It can be birthday presents, it can be holidays, really anything in, in, in any fashion. And uh, again, the adults give the money to the kids the way the kids live, which is through mobile, through digital. And then the kids can do three things in a fourth very big one in the background. So the kids can save, they can do good. We work with a long list of uh, nationwide charities from American Cancer Society to Girls Who Code. And the third thing the kids can do is they can spend. And they can spend money in our Jasby shop, which is in-app. And we uh, work with a long list of brands and stores. Uh, and you can buy anything from a video game to a karaoke microphone to fashion and hats and accessories. Um, and we're just now, in these days, uh, we're launching the Jasby virtual debit card. So you could also use the debit card anywhere really that Apple Pay is accepted. But maybe most important is that through those things and through the activities, uh, the kids and the family and maybe in, as a total, uh, they learn financial literacy. In financial literacy, understanding money is one of, you know, our biggest issues here in the U.S. We are located worldwide um, in a very unflattering position in the list of uh, countries as to our population, especially young population financial literacy. And I'm a strong believer that financial literacy is something that you learn through action and not through boring lectures. So by doing is how you know how money behaves. If you save a little money and we give you a little bit of interest, you understand what interest is and so on and so forth. So there is a large, I believe, social impact uh, in Jasby, and that's teaching and promoting financial literacy and financial wellness for the next generation. Excellent, thank you very much. And of course, your previous entrepreneurial experience was at Credo Racks, which is an international merchant acquiring bank. Uh, it's a very unusual business, it's an arcane business, not too many people know what that is. Please explain Credo Racks and then its position in the market and its offering, and then how that background prepared you for Jaspi, because I think they're, they build on one another. Your experience in one led to your success in the second. So yes, thank you. So Credorax is a global processor and acquiring bank. So what that means really is that we've built our own in-house platform, technology platform, that can knows how to process credit card transactions and alternative payment transactions worldwide. We also have proprietary BI uh, technology, anti-fraud technology, and you know many other bells and whistles. And in the same time, we also have a legal infrastructure for Credorox, which is banking licenses. So Credorox is a bank. We are licensed in some 28 or 29 countries worldwide. Um, and what we do really is that we help merchants, sellers of good and, goods and services, process credit card and debit card and other types of transactions anywhere in the world. And our claim to fame is especially online transactions and especially cross-border transactions. Cross-border means that the buyer sits in one country and the seller of goods or services sits in another country, sometime in another continent. So those type of transactions are more difficult. They are um, subject sometimes to more fraud, but even if not, their approval rate are traditionally lower because they're a little bit, again, more complicated in the and the traditional players, the legacy players, are less prepared to handle those types of transactions. 
Uh, so this is what we do uh, in Credorox. We serve thousands of merchants, process billions of dollars every year, um, very nice growth. Um, so, you know, that's what we do. I think you, to your question about how did that, you know, prepare me or help you with JASB, um, you know, I'm a payments geek. I'm not a, I'm not a technology person. My background is that I used to be an attorney. I always tell people, don't, don't hold it against me. I haven't practiced in many years, but um, I used to be an attorney. And what I understand really well, and I think my experience in Credorox helped me understand it even better, is the payments ecosystem, how everything works with everything else. And payments and fintech in general is extremely heavily regulated. Um, so the legal background, you know, helps as well. So in, in order to make a product work in fintech, you need to, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. You need to make a lot of small pieces fit exactly right together and then have all of this puzzle, um, making sure that all of this puzzle is working according to regulation and according to law. So, you know, I've been dealing with this for a decade and a half now, maybe even a little bit more in understanding all those little intricacies in Credorox really helped me launch Jazby, I think, you know, faster, maybe better. Yes, your experience certainly comes in handy and <clears throat> the evolution of you as a CEO um, is really striking and, and, and impressive. Um, what would you say are the differences that you faced raising the financing for Credorax versus raising the financing for Jazby? Hmm. So I think for me personally, raising money at the beginning for Credorox was, was extremely challenging. So, and, and there was two reasons for that. One I think is, is because of the nature of what the business is. And the other one is, uh, is the world. So I start with the first one. You know, one of the things I love about Jazby is that anybody who has a kid or, you know, has teens or kids in the family, I can explain it in two seconds or, you know, with two, with two slides. You have, you have kids, you give them allowance. How do you give them allowance? If you give them cash, they can't buy video games or iPad games or anything like that. And then it's very easy to explain and people just get it. Credorox is a B2B business, which is super specif specified and, and very complicated. And, you know, my experience is that I used to carry with me like a 45 uh, slides deck. I'm, and I'm not, you know, trying to be funny. And I would uh, go into a meeting and with VCs or others and try to explain it. And people after half an hour would tell me, what? You know, like they, it's, it's, it's difficult. You really need to be in the industry to understand what the hell is going on and why is that important and what's the problem that is being solved. Um, especially at the beginning, you know, when you are as an entrepreneur yourself, you know, at the very beginning, you have this general idea and vision, but it's not, it's not very necessarily precise, which is okay. But if it's not exactly precise, it's even more difficult to explain. So on one hand, I think the business model or the, or, or, or the complication of Credorox um, was a little bit of, a, of an issue, you know, to get through to the investors at the beginning. The second issue for me um, was that I tried first to raise money uh, in 2008. I actually tried, I, I started raising money for Credorox, I think about a couple of months after Lehman Brothers. And I would uh, walk into a room and tell a VC, listen, I have this great idea. I'm going to start an international acquiring bank. And, um, you know, I, I sometimes were thrown out of the room, you know, physically. Sometimes I would just laughed out of the room. So the timing for starting raising money with Credorox was, was questionable. Um, but, you know, a lot of great companies start at the time of crisis. So it's, it's okay. Um, but yeah, so I think Credorox was a very unique and unusual experience for me. And with JASB, it was different. So one, three things. So one, I've already, I knew a lot more people. Um, and, you know, it was easy, easier for me to access, you know, the network. Um, the second is that the product is easier to explain. And third, that there is no, at the time, uh, was no financial crisis. Um, so yeah, it was definitely easier the second time around. Um, let's go to advice you'd have for other entrepreneurs who are following in your footsteps. They're big feet or big shoes to fill. So let's see what you can do to help them. Specifically in regard to fintech startups, what specifically um, would be advice you might say that would help them get an edge up um, in the fintech funding landscape? 
So when I thought about this and, you know, preparing for, for our conversation, um, I think about three things. I think one of them is maybe more specific to fintech and then the other two are more general. So the one thing that's specific more to fintech, I, I, I talked to you for a second about Jasby. So Jasby, we touch money, right? So obviously like anything that touches money, there are tons of regulations and banking laws and FDIC and uh, bank vendors and, and, and really like tons and tons. And each of the states, each of the 50 states have their own set of, of banking and in credit card and debit card and all of those um, regulations. But Jasby also deals with, with kids. And then you have to deal with, uh, with privacy issues, not only general privacy issues, but also specific privacy issues around kids, what's known as COPA, Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. So the reason I'm mentioning this is, you know, in FinTech specifically, there's so much regulation. Um, I think it's second maybe only to drugs and to food. Right, so money and anything we put into our body is heavily regulated. And oftentimes it really deters people and maybe with good reason, but my experience is that I don't, my advice would be maybe is don't let regulation deter you. So study the regulation and just, just do it. So it's completely doable. And I can tell you that I, for years, went around the world and asked for bank licenses from, I don't know, almost any government that would talk to me so all across Europe, here in the United States, in Japan, in Hong Kong. Um, and I think the trick, if there, if, if there is a trick, uh, you know, is, is just to go and talk to them and go and, you know, consult with your attorneys and then follow the regulations. And unlike what a lot of people think, regulators are normally, and again, I've done this in 30 countries, they are friendly, they want to help as long as you are genuine and you really want to do business the right way. So don't let, don't let the fear of regulation deter you. The two other things that I would say in more generally is one, um, if you already have a company and you have, if you already started company and you, and you, you got your first funding is go and hire the best people that you can have and you can possibly find. Don't try and save money. Don't hire somebody that's a little bit less good because you can pay him or her a little bit less money. Hire the best possible ta talent that you, can, that you can get. And don't compromise on this because this is the success or the failure of the company. It's only your people and only the team that you have around you. And the third, if you haven't got um, funding yet, yet funding is, um, is a game of patience in a game of uh, large numbers. So what I, at least again, what I do is I go to a lot of meetings, large funnel, and you start, you know, going from one to the other to the, to the next, and you don't get deterred if you hear no, and you often will hear no, and it's okay, and it's not about you most of the time, and it doesn't matter. You just go to the next one, and then to the next one, then to the next one, until you find, you know, the correct answer. So, I would tell you something like this. If you go to three and four and you hear no, I wouldn't rush to change your business model because that's not enough input. If you go to 50 and you hear no from all the 50, then maybe take a step back, but, but go to 50, right? And what I've often see with people who come to talk to me is that they went to three, four and then they heard no's and then they, you know, their head is down and they look at the floor and they start feeling depressed because something is wrong with them and, and then they just quit. So just do it again and again and again, and don't quit. Yes, Benny, your persistence is legendary, and it's extremely important for an entrepreneurial trait. It's uh, you know, part of your great success among many talents. Talk to us a little bit about the special challenges that um, Jasby has uh, confronted during the COVID crisis, and then look out into the future as we go through the recovery. What do you see for Jasby as trials, tribulations, and then ultimate uh, factors for success? So maybe our biggest challenge, uh, again, it's a very specific situation. Um, we started sales the end of last year and, um, you know, it, it was all very new to us, uh, but a lot of the products that we sell on the Jasby shop, we were buying from, from vendors, getting into the Jasby facility and then shipping from there. So one in general, and we started seeing this even at the end of the year, uh, when, when sales started to ramp up, it was a challenge doing this for, for a small startup shipping large, 
quantities of physical products like video games. It's challenging be beyond the price and the cost, just physically to do it. Um, it wasn't easy. And we, at the beginning of the year, we started moving our model into drop shipment. So we, we, you know, we buy from our distributors, but we never actually touch the product and they ship it. But we were at the very beginning of this transition when COVID hit. And we couldn't, we didn't, you know, finish this transition in time. And then when COVID hit, it hit not obviously not only us, but also our distributors. So they were less ready or, or capable of making this transition fast enough. So it took us a good number of months to move to where we are today, where everything is completely drop ship and we don't touch anything. It's, it's completely automated and integrated and APIs and all of those nice things. Um, but that was a big challenge. So doing this transition in the middle of a crisis and especially our ability to communicate and work together with, the, with those distributors who themselves were facing a crisis, right? Um, so that's, that's, I think, our biggest you know, challenge in 2020. Um, moving forward, so I tell, I tell you what I, I think that, look, there's been this trend in payments going cashless, going contactless for a while now. I think it's probably about a decade now, moving more and more online and mobile even more than online. But I think specifically, by the way, I think the United States compared to other parts of the world, especially Europe, was a little bit behind the curve on, on all of this. And I think if anything, COVID has really, you know, made the, the, the progress, it's, it's skyrocketing. And, and I think now cash would probably completely go away much sooner than, than it would have anyway. But I also think the plastic would, because who wants to touch those? Who wants to give 20 to the cashier and then get change? And who knows who touched those, you know, dollar bills or coins before you? And even using it, debit card or a credit card on the POS device and you need to put it in and again touch some keypads and again who knows who touched this before you so contactless mobile online all of those things would accelerate dramatically acceptance of Apple Pay and Google Pay would accelerate dramatically and all of the, th those are things that Jasby plays right into right um, so for example when we issued the debit card the Jasby debit card it's completely virtual there is no plastic because there is no need for it. So it's all contactless. So I think again, moving forward, that's a big trend that we would see into 2021 and beyond. As the COVID crisis moved from East to West, first starting in China, throughout Asia, then to Europe, and then finally into the North American continent and beyond, it seemed like the world was ending. The stock market fell by 35%. Uh, many businesses were locked down and shut down, some of them unfortunately now permanently because they ran out of business. The world looked very bleak, and yet there were special challenges and special opportunities afforded to Credit Racks. Can you talk to how Credit Racks has faced the challenge of the COVID lockdowns and perhaps the mm, acceleration of movement toward e-commerce and how we're dealing with that now and what the future look like, looks like for Credit Racks? Yes. So in Credox, you know, we are, um, for, for a while now, we are a cloud company way before COVID. In our, so we were an international company and we were very cutting edge, still are in our technology. So everything is in the cloud and everything is able to be managed remotely. So when COVID hit, within literally 24 hours, we just moved our entire workforce, about 300 people strong, something like that. Um, to home. And we did this in Israel, we did this in the United States, we did this in Malta, we did this in London. So it's not one country, we just did it, you know, globally, literally overnight. And the next day we were working from home as if nothing happened. And because our systems were so strong in, in cloud-based, it just worked really, really well for us. So there was surprisingly no no hicks and, and, and no, no problems. And it just, you know, next morning we, we, we walked from home. And then I think the other thing is that, so the, the, how advanced our platform is and our technology is reliability wise, for example. So, you know, our claim to fame for a long time has been our ability to do cross-border and our really, really advanced BI. 
but reliability is something that is very, very strong and important with, with Cradorx, which means we have no downtime, almost, almost completely, like 100%. And reliability is one of those things that as a merchant, as a client, you usually don't think about until something bad happens, right? So uh, it's like oxygen, it's completely, it's colorless, it's you know, smellless, you don't know until God forbid you don't have it and then you really take notice. So it's the same thing when the systems of the legacy um, providers, the legacy processors started going down because they couldn't support it because their teams couldn't convert to working from home fast enough and so on and so forth. So when their system started to go down, we saw merchants coming to us and say, hey, can you process for us? Because then they understood how much reliability counts. Um, and again, we were concentrated for years now on online transactions, which is obviously the, the thing that, you know, COVID not only did not impact, but if there was an impact, then it, it increased. So all the physical transaction moved online. So our business really, really took off. Um, and, you know, and, and we, we were very good at, uh, at handling the, the crisis. Benny, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. For those of you in the audience, for additional insights and more conversations with entrepreneurs, please visit BloombergCapital.com. There's a lot there waiting for you to see. Thank you. Thank you so much.